morning. It is my pleasure to provide this Heart and Stroke Foundation and Canadian Stroke Best Practices Canadian Neurological Scale training video. This training video is part of the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendations Acute Stroke Management Module. It provides guidance and tools to advance and improve stroke services to achieve optimal inpatient stroke care delivery and patient outcomes in hospitals across Canada. The outline for today's presentation is I will provide an overview of the objectives, will provide background information on the Canadian Neurological Scale, provide an overview of the tool utilizing a case study, and finally we'll walk through several case studies for participants to apply the learning that they have applied. The Canadian Neurological Scale is being used with permission from Dr. Robert Cote. I am Rhonda McNichol-Whiteman. I am the Clinical Nurse Specialist with the Central South Regional Stroke Network based at Hamilton Health Sciences. I have no conflicts to declare. The overview, the objectives for the presentation is at the end, participants will be able to review the background and evidence related to the Canadian Neurological Scale, to identify steps to complete the Canadian Neurological Scale, to apply the scoring of the Canadian Neurological Scale using case scenarios, and finally, to describe the tools available to support utilization of the Canadian Neurological Scale in clinical practice. The Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendation Stroke Assessment and Prevention Pocket Guide on pages 11 and 12 provide instructions on how to complete the Canadian Neurological Scale. This tool will be an excellent resource to utilize as I am providing an overview of the tool and finally at the end when we are walking through several case scenarios. Up to 50% of stroke patients may deteriorate after admitted to hospital. Early detection of this neurological deterioration and provision of early interventions in these patients can limit neurological deterioration and improve outcomes. Despite advances in technology, the sensitivity of skilled observers using standardized stroke assessment tools has not been surpassed. The Canadian Neurological Scale was developed in 1985 in Montreal by Dr. Robert Cote and Dr. Vladimir Hashinsky as a complementary tool to the Glasgow Coma Scale to assess impairment in conscious and aphasic stroke patients. It was developed for the assessment of stroke patients in their acute phase of care to monitor for changes in neurological status. It is short and simple to use. It takes approximately five to 10 minutes to administer. It is a standardized tool that addresses the issue of aphasia and can be done repeatedly at the bedside. The Canadian Neurological Scale has been found to have strong psychometric properties. It has been found to have excellent internal consistency in all domains using the Chromebox Alpha. It has also been found to have adequate to excellent iterator reliability for all domains. It also has excellent correla correlation between the total Canadian Neurological Scale score and standardized neurological examinations and excellent concurrent validity between the Canadian Neurological Scale and the Global Neurological Examination. The initial Canadian Neurological Scale score was found to have predictive validity in that the initial Canadian Neurological Scale score could predict death within three to six months, morbidity, and recoveries of activities of daily living within three to five months. For patients with an initial Canadian Neurological Scale score of 11 or more, they were found 2.1% had died within six months, whereas patients who had a Canadian Neurological Scale score of nine or less, 13.2 had died within six months. 
I will now provide an overview of the Canadian Neurological Scale. The Canadian Neurological Scale is divided up into two parts. Section A, Mentation. Section 2, Motor Function Testing. Section A, Mentation, looks at level of consciousness, orientation, and speech. Section 2, Motor Function, assess impairment of the face, arm, and leg using a weighted scale. These items were chose, chosen based on the prevalence and functional impact on stroke. I will walk through how we complete each of these components. We have included on this slide an example of the Canadian Neurological Scale documentation template. We will utilize this documentation template to walk through how we would score the tool as I provide an overview and also at the end as we are scoring the case scenarios. To help us uh, apply uh, the Canadian Neurological Scale scoring, we'll utilize a case scenario as I provide an overview. So we have a 72-year-old man who was brought to the emergency department with acute onset of stroke symptoms. His assessment in the emergency department found him to be alert, oriented to place and time, able to follow one-step commands, able to understand a more complicated question, able to name simple objects and identify their use, left-sided facial weakness, and dense left-sided hemiplegia in his arm and leg. Consider this, present, this case scenario as we walk through how to complete the Canadian Neurological Scale. First, we'll start with Section A, Mentation. So when we look at mentation, we start by looking at level of consciousness. Based on observation of the patient, we would score the level of consciousness based on either the how the patient presents as being alert or drowsy. Alert would be scored if the patient is awake, has spontaneous eye opening, and has a normal level of consciousness versus patients who are considered drowsy, who um, have eye opening to either speech or light touch, rouses when stimulated verbally. They may remain awake and alert, but tend to doze for short periods. If the patient is alert, they would receive a score of three. If the patient is drowsy, they would receive a score of 1.5. So if we go back to our case scenario, how would we score his level of consciousness? He would be scored three at alert and receive a score of three. We then move on to orientation. Here we assess orientation in two domains, to place and time. To assess orientation, we ask the patient, where are they? What is the city and what is the place? We also then move to ask what is the month and the year? Here, if it is at the beginning of the month, uh, the first three days of the month, the previous month is considered acceptable. Scoring for orientation is either alert, is either oriented or disoriented. Oriented would be scored if the patient is oriented to both place and time and would receive a score of one. If the patient is not able to answer the questions about orientation correctly, uh, does not respond to the questions, is not able to speak, the patient would be scored as disoriented or not applicable and receive a score of zero. So if we go back to our case scenario, how would we score his orientation? He would be scored as oriented as the patient is oriented to place and time. 
Next, we move on to speech assessment. Here, we are assessing for receptive deficits. Here, we would ask the patient to close their eyes. Does a stone sink in water? And ask the patient to point to the ceiling. You can repeat the question uh, if required, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to mimic the responses that we want the patient to complete. So we wouldn't want to be closing our eyes as we're asking them to close their eyes. If the patient is able to complete all of the three commands, you would continue to expressive language testing. However, if the patient does not complete all three of the uh, commands, you would stop language testing and score the patient as a receptive deficit. You then would proceed to Section A2 motor testing with a comprehension deficit. In this situation, we are going to say that the patient was able to close their eyes, the patient was able to indicate that yes, a stone sinks in water, and the patient was able to point to the ceiling. We that now move on to expressive deficit. Here you need a key, a watch, and a pencil. What you want to do is show the patient each item and ask them to identify the use. So I would want to say, what is the, this? What is this? And what is this? Then I would want to ask the patient, what does the watch do? What does the pen do? What does the key do? If the patient is not able to state the name of each and the use of each item, they would be scored as an expressive deficit and receive a score of 0.5. Patient will be considered to have normal speech if they are able to state the name of each item and the use of each item. If the patient's speech is slurred, you would indicate an SL beside the score. However, just having slurred speech does not lose points. You would only lose points if the words are unintelligible and you cannot understand what the patient is stating. So if we go back to our case scenario, how would we score his speech? Well, he is able to follow one-step commands and able to understand a more complicated question. So there is no receptive deficit. He's able to name simple objects and identify their use, so there is no expressive uh, deficit. So he would be scored normal speech and receive a score of one. When we look at scoring the total mentation score with our, pa our patient case scenario, he would be alert, receive a score of three, be oriented, receive a score of one, and have normal speech. His total mentation score is five. We'll now move on to section two, motor function. Motor function is divided into two parts. Section A1, which is for patients who motor function with no comprehension deficit. Section A2, motor function with a comprehension deficit. Both Section A1 and A2 look at face, arm, and legs. When we look at Section A1, motor testing with no comprehension deficit, we know the patient is able to understand and follow commands. Therefore, the patient is able to oppose resistance applied by the examiner and we are able to grade the degree of deficit in the patient's arms and legs. So when we look at motor function testing in A1, we look at facial weakness, impairment or weakness in the proximal and distal arms, proximal and distal legs. So we'll start by looking at motor testing of the face. 
here we ask the patient to smile, show their teeth. Um, we're looking for a symmetry of the, no of the mouth and the nasal labial folds. Scoring for uh, motor testing in the face is either none, no weakness. In this situation, the patient has a very asymmetrical grin. Um, there's no uh, flattening of the nasal labial folds. Uh, they would receive a score of 0.5. Versus facial weakness present, here you would have one corner of the mouth maybe lower than the other, either at rest or while showing their teeth, and their asymmetry of the face. Here you, the patient would receive a score of zero, and we would indicate if the weakness is on the right or the left side. If the weakness is on the right, we would use an R, if the weakness is on the left, we would use an L. So if we go back to our case scenario, how would we score his facial weakness? He would be indicated facial weakness present, receive a score of zero, and we would indicate L because the weakness is on the left. Next, we move on to proximal arm motor function assessment. There are two ways that we can evaluate the motor function of the proximal arms. The first is having, if the patient is sitting in a chair, we would ask them to abduct their arms to 90 degrees, and we would apply resistance to the biceps. In the lower picture is how we would evaluate if the patient is lying in bed. Here, we would ask the patient to elevate their arms to 45 to 90 degrees, and apply resistance um, on the biceps. We would never apply resistance on the joints, always apply it on the muscles. Scoring for proximal arms or for each of the elements of A1 motor testing is the same. None indicates no weakness. Here, uh, it is scored by that there is no weakness to resistance by the examiner. If we look at mild, the patient can move the arms in this situation to a normal range of motion against gravity, but when the examiner applies resistance, they are not able to overcome the resistance applied by the examiner. Significant weakness would be scored if the patient is unable to overcome gravity in range of motion, their movement is less than 90 degrees. So in this situation with the proximal arm, is if one arm was not able to be lifted off the bed to full range, one arm was not able to be abducted uh, to full range to 90, they would be scored significant. Total weakness would be scored if there is absence of movement in the muscles or only contraction of the muscles without movement. When we look at scoring, none would be scored 1.5, mild would be scored 1.0, significant would receive a score of 0.5, and total would be scored as a zero. As with the face, we would indicate the, the side of the weakness with either an R or an L. We now move on to motor function in the distal arms. Patients can be assessed either sitting or lying. We are asking them to elevate their arms, make a fist, and dorsiflex their wrists. Here we're able to compare each uh, range of motion in each wrist simultaneously. If the patient is able to do full range, we then would test strength by applying resistance to both wrists. Scoring is the same as it is with proximal arms. In this situation, what would differentiate a significant uh, versus a mild weakness in the distal arms is in a significant weakness, there's some movement of the fingers, but movement is less than 90. The patient is not able to bring a dorsiflex the wrist to 90. I find it's helpful to ask the patient to do the movement that, that we are uh, wanting to assess because then you can very quickly see is it a significant 
versus a mild because if they're not able to do full range, you know they're automatically you're automatically significant on that side. Again, if there is a uh, weakness, you would indicate RRL on the side of weakness. So let's go back to our case scenario. How would we score his proximal and distal arm weakness? It says the patient has dense left hemiplegia in his arm. Therefore, the patient would be scored total or absence of movement um, in the proximal arm and the distal arm, both receiving a zero on the left side. We then move on to proximal legs. Here, again, we want the patient lying in bed. We want to bring their hips towards the body one at a time, keeping the knees flexed to 90 degrees. If the patient's able to bring their hip up, their thigh up to 90, we then press down on one thigh at a time. We then, after we've assessed the one limb leg, we move and assess the other. Here, the scoring is the same as it is with the uh, arms. We then move on to distal uh, legs. Here we're looking at ankle dorsiflexion. We want the toes and legs pointed upward. We want to ask the patient to bring their toes to their nose. You then want to push down on each foot one at a time. Here, if the patient has some movement of the toes and the foot, but not able to dorsiflex their foot back to 90 degrees, the patient would be scored as significant. Um, if the patient is able to dorsiflex uh, their ankle with full range, but cannot absorb the resist, oppose the resistance of the examiner, the patient would be scored as mild. Patient would have no weakness if they're able to oppose the resistance of the examiner, and again, patient would be scored total if there is absence of movement in the muscles or only contraction with no movement. So if we go back to our case study, how would we score the proximal and distal leg weakness? Patient has dense left hemiplegia in that leg, so would receive a, a score of total weakness in the proximal leg, total weakness in the distal leg, receiving a score of zero on both of those items. Here, if we look at the A1 motor testing uh, the tool, you'll see in this situation the patient had present on the left, receiving a score of zero. Proximal and distal arms were scored as total, so receiving zero in both of those on the left. And proximal and distal legs, again, also receiving a total weakness zero um, on the left. So in this situation, our case scenario um, received zero on A1 motor testing. So then if we look at the total Canadian neurological scale score for our patient, we know that they received five on mentation. So three for alert, one for orientation, one for normal speech, but had weakness um, in the face, total weakness in the proximal and distal arms, total weakness in the proximal and distal legs, the patient's total Canadian neurological scale score would be five. We'll now move on to Section A2, motor function with a comprehension deficit. The patient is unable to understand and follow commands. As a result, we know because the patient isn't able to understand and follow commands, they would not be able to oppose resistance by the examiner. Therefore, we are not able to grade the degree of weakness uh, in the arm and leg. So here we test facial weakness, total arm, total leg weakness. Because the patient may not uh, follow your command or understand to ask them to smile, here we are going to get the patient to mimic your smile. We're gonna smile at the patient and see if they will smile back. We will then note 
if the mouth and nasal labial folds are symmetrical or not. Scoring here is either symmetrical or asymmetrical. Symmetrical would indicate that there is no, motor, no facial weakness, no flattening of the nasal labial folds, the patient would receive a score of 0.5. If, though, there's asymmetry of the face, there's flattening of the nasal labial folds, there's facial drooping, facial weakness, the patient would be scored uh, asymmetrical, receive a score of zero, and we would indicate the side of weakness with an R or an L. Next, we move on to A2 motor testing. Here, we are going to raise the patient's arms out front, out, or raise the patient's arms in front of them at 90 degrees and see if the patient can maintain their arms equally raised for three to five seconds. Here, we score them as either equal or unequal. Equal would be scored if there is equal movement in both arms and would receive a score of 1.5. If, though, the patient is not able to maintain both arms equally, so there's mild drifting of one arm within three to five seconds, the patient's not able to overcome gravity, the patient's arm is flaccid and they're not able to lift off the bed, they would be scored unequal and we would indicate the side of weakness. If the patient is not cooperative, in keeping their arms uh, raised out in front of them for three to five seconds, you can apply painful pressure to the nail beds and observe how each limb withdraws to the painful stimuli to see if they do it equally. When we look at legs, we're going to lift one leg up and flex the hip to 90 and see if the patient can keep that leg up for three to five seconds. After you've tested the one leg, you would then test the other and compare responses. As with the arms, if the patient's not able to cooperate, uh, you can apply the toe uh, nail pressure bilaterally and compare their withdrawals to pain. I find that usually you are able to determine um, weakness in the total arms and legs and it's not necessary to apply toenail pressure, uh, but both of those options are available for assessing the arm and leg weakness. Scoring for the legs is again the same with the arms. It's either equal, 1.5, or unequal, zero. When we look at equal motor movement, um, that again, that's how you would score equal versus unequal, patients not able to maintain their leg raised equally for three to five seconds, not able to overcome gravity, has mild drifting. Again, we would indicate the side of weakness with either an R or an L. Scoring for A2 is again, you can see the total score that we would look at for A2 motor testing is a 3.5. Um, and again, it's either symmetrical or asymmetrical for the face, equal or unequal for the arms and their legs. So how do we score the Canadian Neurological Scale? So when we look at the Canadian Neurological Scale, we score Section A, Mentation, for all patients. We then score either A1 motor testing no comprehension deficit, or A2, uh, motor testing with comprehension deficit. It's either A1 or A2, not both. So when we look at scoring of the Canadian Neurological Scale, minimum score is 1.5. This would be a patient who's drowsy, disoriented, receptive language deficit, um, asymmetrical face, unequal arm and leg movement. This is a very low Canadian Neurological Scale score and a very severe stroke. The maximum score on the Canadian Neurological Scale is 11.5. This would be a normal score 
the patient has no stroke deficit. A higher Canadian neurological scale score indicates the patient has a less severe stroke. As we know from the predictive validity, patients with an initial Canadian neurological scale score greater than 11 had a more favorable outcome, and those with a score less than nine tended to be associated with increased morbidity and mortality after stroke. Dr. Cote and Dr. Hashinsky had found in their research of the Canadian neurological scale that a decrease of more than one point from the previous Canadian neurological scale score indicated that there may be a change in the patient's status and requires notification of the physician. This may indicate that there has been neurological deterioration in the patient or a medical condition that is impairing the neurological status. So how often should I use it? Well, the Canadian Neurological Scale is utilized to assess neurological functioning in the patient in the acute stroke period. So how frequently I would complete the Canadian Neurological Scale depends on a number of factors. One, it depends on the condition of the patient and whether or not the patient has received hyperacute stroke therapy, so acute stroke thrombolysis or stroke mechanical thrombectomy, or of patients who have not received um, any of those uh, hyperacute treatment. So what I've provided is in patients who've received acute stroke thrombolysis or acute stroke uh, mechanical thrombectomy, I have provided a guideline um, about how you often you would complete the Canadian Neurological Scale score. Um, and then we know for patients who have not received thrombolysis, it would identify that patients should have their neurological status evaluated every four hours for the first 48, um, and then if stable, to decrease their frequency based on their unit policy. So these are some guidelines that you can utilize for how often I would perform the Canadian Neurological Scale. So now we are going to apply what we've learned and the overview of the Canadian Neurological Scale to three case scenarios. The first is a 50-year-old woman who on assessment in the emergency department, she is alert. She is oriented to place only. She is able to follow simple one-step commands. She's able to nod if a stone sinks in water. She's not able to identify a key, a watch, or a pencil, or the use of each object. She has right-sided facial weakness. She's able to lift her right proximal and distal arm off the bed, but not able to do full range. She has no weakness in her left arm. She has no spontaneous movement in the right proximal and distal leg and there is no weakness in the left leg. So now, let's use the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendation Stroke Assessment and Prevention Pocket Guide to score mentation on this case. Now, let's score motor function. Determine do we use section A1 or A2? So when we look at scoring with our first case scenario, the patient is alert. The patient is disoriented, has an expressive deficit. So we then move to A1 motor testing patient had a right-sided facial weakness, significant weakness in their proximal arm, was able to have movement of the arm but not able to do full range. In the distal arm, was also scored as significant, so was able to lift it off but not able to do, not able to dorsiflex the wrist, so they would received a 0.5 on the right. The right proximal, and distal leg, there was no spontaneous movement, so received a score of total for the proximal leg, total for the distal leg, 
so a total Canadian neurological scale score of 4.5. We'll move on to our next case scenario, a 65-year-old man. He's alert, he's not oriented to place or time, not able to follow simple one-step commands, not able to answer the question if a stone sinks in water, has right-sided facial weakness, is able to keep his left arm and leg raised for five seconds, but his right arm and leg drift to the bed within two seconds. So using the Canadian Stroke Best Practices Stroke Assessment and Prevention Pocket Guide score mentation on our second case. Now consider how we would score motor function. Do we do section A1, no receptive deficit, or do we do section A2, receptive deficit present? Score, face, arm, and leg weakness for our second case. So when we look at scoring, our second case was alert, was disoriented, and had a receptive deficit. We know then we move down to section A2, comprehension deficit, and here we know that there is right-sided facial weakness, and the movement in his right arm is unequal to his left because there was mild drifting after two minutes, two seconds, and we also know that his right leg is unequal. There was mild drifting after two seconds. Patient received a score of three for uh, his total CNS score. Our last case scenario is a 40-year-old woman. On assessment to the emergency department, she roused to verbal stimuli. She wasn't oriented to place or time. She was able to follow simple one-step commands, able to answer if a stone sinks in water, unable to identify a key, a watch, and a pencil and their use, right-sided facial weakness, able to lift the right proximal and distal arm off the bed, do full range of motion, but not able to overcome the resistance of the observer, had no weakness in the left arm, was able to lift the right proximal and distal leg off the bed, but not do full range of motion, and no weakness of the left leg. So using the uh, Stroke Assessment and Prevention Pocket Guide, score mentation on our final case. Now score motor function. So when we look at scoring with our last case, the patient is drowsy. She needed to be stimulated verbally. Um, so received a score of 1.5, was not oriented to place or time, had a receptive deficit, had a right-sided facial weakness, had a mild weakness in the proximal arm, was able to do full range, but not overcome resistance of the observer. In the distal arm, again, was able to do full range, but not able to overcome resistance, so was also scored a mild and received a one. The proximal and distal leg was able to move the, mo the leg, the proximal and distal leg, but not able to do full range, so was, was scored significant in both. Patient received a total Canadian Neurological Scale score of five. That ends this training video. Please take time to provide your feedback and insight on this training video by completing the survey, which you can access through the Canadian Neurological Scale resource page. 
it would be uh, on the page you use to access this video, um, you will find the evaluation form. Here are my references for the presentation. Thank you very much for your time.